worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what a Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done has done great things. Oh, here of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. I've done great things. You've been faithful through every storm. You'll be faithful forevermore. You have done great things. And I know you. God, you do great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive, you break every chain. Oh, God, you will do great things. You dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name. I, oh God, you have done great things. Hallelujah, God, above it all. Hallelujah, God, unshakable. Hallelujah, you have done great things. chain oh god you have done great things we dance in your freedom awake and alive oh jesus our savior your name lifted high oh god you have done great things hi everyone and happy new year we are so glad that you are here with us today this beautiful sunday morning happy new year
your word will come to pass my heart will see your praise again Jesus you're still
redemption written on his hands. Jesus, you will reign forevermore. The victory is yours. We sing your praise. Endless hallelujahs to Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this brand new year of 2021, Lord, and we thank you for the good things that we know you are going to do in this year. God, because you are constant, you are always good, you are always full of love and peace, God, and we can seek after you. And I pray, Lord, that this year, despite the challenges that will carry over, despite the hurts and the disappointments, God, that we would be so challenged this year to be faithful and committed to seeking after you, Lord. God, that every day we would be so excited and so ready to jump and seek your face, Lord. God, that we would seek revival for ourselves, for our families. God, that we would allow you to work through us, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would guide us and lead us to people in our neighborhoods, to people in our families, God, who don't know you. And God, I know that this has been a very different year where we haven't been able to meet as a church family like we used to, God. But Lord, I pray that we would all know that you are working, God. You are reaching the lost, God, through us, Lord. We are seeing lives change. We are seeing your healing, God. We are seeing your provision through everything that's been going on, Lord, that we know that in these moments when we're meeting together online, God, people are being saved, people are being reached, Lord. We thank you, God, for technology. We thank you that we can do it this way. And God, though we are so excited for the day where we can see each other in person again, when we can shake hands, when we can hug each other, God, we know that that day will come. And God, we know that until that day comes, you are constant, you are strong, you are our peace, you are our joy, and may we continue to seek after you every single day. 
God, would you speak to us today, Lord? Would you give us a fresh word, a fresh vision for our lives today, God? And we thank you for this new year and the opportunities we have to serve you that are ahead of us this year. God, we praise you and we're so excited to serve you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. If this is your first time joining us in this new year, we want to welcome you. We're so glad that you're here with us today. If you click the new here button above and fill out a little bit of information about yourself, we can give you a Starbucks gift card as just a little thank you for coming by today. Hey Harlan kids, we're back! In case you have forgotten, I'm the Miganator. And I'm the Fresh Prince of Javier. It's a new year, another chance to make great plans on how I can be a better person. So, what's your plans? Oh, that's easy. I've got lots of them. But first, did you see my Dogman book? I'm planning on reading a new book each week. I put it down a few minutes ago, and now I can't find it. Did you ask Mom? Yeah, I would, but you know what she would say. Yeah, look three, then ask me. Yep. Then, so let's look three places. Okay. Mom! Did you see my dog man book? Nope. Did you look right in front of you? It was right here all along. She just knows, even when she's not near us. Did you find it? Yep, right in front of us. Hmm, this reminds me about the story of John the Baptist and Jesus. What? Well, John the Baptist was trying to prepare the people for the Savior. Do you remember who the Savior was? Jesus! That's right. But Jesus was among them, and they didn't even know it. That's what today's Heartland Kids Grow TV is about. Really? We could go watch it now. Yeah, we don't want to miss the ep uh, episode of Grow TV. Well, until next week, don't forget to like and subscribe. Until next time, Meganator and Fresh Prince of Javier out. Well, good morning, Heartland. How are you doing? Happy New Year, even though it's an interesting New Year because not much has changed from 2020, December 31st to 2021, January 1st. But you know what? It is a new year and I'm really excited about it for a lot of reasons. But uh, as I was studying and praying and thinking about what does God want to say to us in this brand new year, I, I, I thought of this statement over here. And, and maybe it's true for you. Maybe it's not. Maybe you feel this way. Maybe you don't. But I thought about this statement here. The first day of the rest of your life, as I thought about, you know, January 1 and January, the beginning of the new year, and really just, a, you know, a brand new 2021, uh, I thought to myself, in some ways, this kind of is like the first day of the rest of our lives. It's a brand new start. Now, for some of you, when you hear that, you think, wow, that's very freeing, you know, because it's a brand new start. It's an opportunity for 2021 to be different than 2020. But others of us, when they hear, you know, this statement or they hear this, the idea or the thought of 2021, it's actually quite frustrating, maybe even depressing, because even though 2020 is gone, I think for some of us, maybe many of us, the challenges of 2020 are going to persist in 2021. And at least, at least what I'm seeing is that this season has been disruptive for so long that it's actually becoming normative. So for example, <clears throat> Uh, the habits that you picked up in the past could have easily been explained away, you know, by saying things like, well, I'm only this way because of the season that we're in. When it's over, I'll be different. I'll be back to my normal self. Uh, I, you know, I get a little bit more angrier, a little bit more easily than I used to. I'm harder to live with maybe, or I eat too much, especially over Christmas and New Year's. But... This isn't the way I normally am, but I'm just seeing and I'm wondering that because this season has been so disruptive for so long that this new you, this new me is actually becoming a lot more normative than I want to admit. And I think because of all that, um, this has been a really sobering, sobering thing that your normal is starting to change. And the deceptive part 
about normal is that people think because it's normal that it must be okay. That because everyone is feeling this way, it's a normal way to feel because everyone is isolated or more easily frustrated or more easily angered. I mean, if you've been out at a grocery store, you've probably seen the frustration because it's not just you, because it's so many people that it must must just be okay because I haven't seen my neighbors for so long that it just must be normal not to talk to them anymore and just instead you know occasionally wave when you get the chance and I think deep down inside we know that this is not normal that there's a healthier way to live I think deep down inside regardless of your context you know we would like this to be the the proverbial first day of the rest of our lives where things are truly different but here's a really important question how do you change normal especially when normal feels so normal how do you get to the first day of the rest of your life when your past life feels easier when your past life looks easier when your past life and past habits seem to take little to no commitment you know this is typically the time of year where we would make new year's resolutions where gym memberships kind of skyrocket and you know, they go through the roof of course that's not happening this year but you know, I think the idea of, of a resolution is healthy because you want to, you need to, I need to make the commitment to those transformational habits that will make my life healthier. But how do you do that in a year where making those commitments is so difficult and challenging? How do you do that in a year when changing the norm even though knowing that the norm is unhealthy, but how do you do it in a year where changing the norm is just so healthy or unhealthy and so difficult? And depending on your worldview, the answer to this question might be radically different. You might change your norm by certain principles that uh, self-help gurus or motivational speakers might give to you. But for me personally, as a as a follower of Christ, as a committed born-again believer, I, I believe this with my whole heart, That without the power and the presence of God in your life, you cannot sustain a new normal in your heart, in your soul, and in your mind. In fact, one of the most tragic things that I have seen as a pastor in my time pastoring is watching the people of God trying to live a, a life that honors God without the power of God in their lives. And I think for me personally, One of the things that I learned about my faith in 2020 is that I relied a lot more on me than I did the power and the presence of God in my life. In fact, as I look back over the year, I relied a lot on my habits. I relied a lot on just the things, just the habits that I created for myself, whether it was swimming regularly or working out or, you know, just things of that nature. And in a context where those things are so much more difficult now, I realized looking back that so much of my inner peace, my inner hope, my inner joy wasn't so much dependent upon what God was doing in my life, but the things that I'd filled my calendar with. And at least I think for some, maybe you'd be willing to admit this, but I think part of the faith burnout that some are experiencing is that, you know, we're realizing that some of our faith, some of that peace and that stability in our hearts, souls, and minds weren't really built on the power and the presence of God, but they were built on the the on really what was in our schedule and in our calendars. And so I, I, I believe this with my whole heart. Maybe you have a different worldview, but I just believe with my whole heart that on, on the first day of the rest of your life, on this in this new season of 2021 more than anything else we need to experience the power and the presence of God in our daily lives and so in this series which we're going to call the first day of the rest of your life we're going to talk about the power and the presence of God in your life and specifically we're going to look at the book of Exodus and study how God gave Israel both a new identity but he allowed allowed them to experience the power or the life-changing power of his presence. That when you read the book of Exodus, if you're new to church, the book of Exodus is all about Israel being set free from slavery in Egypt and then going through the wilderness and receiving the, the law, the Ten Commandments. And in fact, there are so many laws mentioned and listed in Exodus, it would be very easy for someone to get the opinion that God is really, really interested <clears throat> in your behavior and the do's and don'ts. In fact, when you read the book of Exodus, 
almost half, almost half the book in Exodus 20, chapter 20, all the way to chapter 40, God gave them laws and rules and regulations. He gave them the 10 commandments. Certainly there were more than just 10 obligations or rules, but there were 10 that he etched into stone. In addition to that, he gave them laws for a just and fair society. Uh, you know, when you're, when you spent 430 years in another country and a majority of that time as slaves, well, you don't really have an identity or, or the laws of a nation. And so God needed to help this fledgling, young, brand new nation with laws for a just and fair society. Uh, within chapters 20 to 40 are behaviors that were supposed to bring out the best in themselves and others and instructions even on how to truly worship the one true God. And so Exodus 20 to 40, that's 20 chapters of do's and don'ts. But how did they get there? How did they get to the first day of the rest of their lives? How did they get from Exodus 20 all the way to Exodus 40? Did they just wake up one day and say, you know what, today is the day I'm going to enact about, you know, maybe a grand total of a couple of hundred new laws and regulations in my life. How did they get here? Did they get here because they had this yearning, burning desire to add another rule in their lives. How do you and I get here? If that's even where God wants us to go. And, you know, when you think about getting to the first day of the rest of your life, how do you get to that first day when your last life seems so much easier? I mean, even as I think about life outside of quarantine, to be honest, while it's not healthy, it is just easier staying inside. How do you get out there again one day when your past life is either easier or maybe your past life won't let you go? And, and, and the big question for me in all this is, how did God intend to get them from where they were to where he wanted them to be? And the simple answer is, he didn't start in chapter 20. In a lot of ways, he started in chapter 19, where he reminded them of both his presence and his presence power. And so in this series called The First Day of the Rest of Your Life, we're going to talk about God's power and God's presence in your life. And, and real specifically, we're going to spend the almost the entirety of this series in one chapter of the Bible, in Exodus chapter 19. And then we will conclude our series in Exodus chapter 33, which in a lot of ways is reminiscent of Exodus chapter 19. And I believe this is a significant thing for us to hear today because before God addressed what they needed to do in Exodus 20 to 40, he talked about what his presence did before their midst and who they were as a people before the presence of God. And so here's what Exodus 19, starting at verse one says, on the first day of the third month after the Israelites left Egypt, on that very day, they came to the desert of Sinai. That journey took about seven weeks, by the way. And so as they got to the desert of Sinai, their time as slaves in Egypt was literally behind them. And what's interesting, and we'll talk about it a little bit later, is that even though they physically left Egypt, emotionally and spiritually, they took at least some of the pain and the problems and the sins of Egypt with them. And I think they did it without even realizing it. And so when God brought them to the promised land, the, the part of Egypt that they brought with them was actually their undoing. Because it doesn't really matter how many miracles God gives you if His presence doesn't change your normal. If you keep going back to the past, if you keep going back to what's abnormal, then what you're holding on to will always infect what God wants to do in your life today. And so they left Egypt physically, but in some ways they didn't leave Egypt spiritually. So this verse goes on to say, uh, verse 2, After they set out from Rephidim, they entered the desert of Sinai, and Israel camped there in the desert in front of the mountain. Before the first day, uh, of the rest of their lives, they decided to camp before the mountain of God. And we're going to come back to this theme of camping before the mountain of God. And, you know, and it just makes me wonder, do we camp today? And I don't mean camping in the Muskogas, which is great, but I mean resting 
before the presence of the God who can do anything in your life. And I just wondered, especially here in our very busy part of the world, if we're just too preoccupied just to rest in his presence and to experience his power washing over us. And then, you know, not only are we too busy to rest in that powerful presence, you know, there are some perhaps who end up blaming God for not experiencing that power that comes from resting in his presence. But they decided on the first day before the rest of their lives to camp before the mountain of God and to rest there. Verse three says, then Moses went up to God and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, this is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob, meaning uh, the promises that God had given to Abraham, Isaac, and, and Jacob. They were still there. There was still yes and amen. God had not forgotten what he had promised in the past and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself, meaning you didn't get here on your own. You didn't get here because of your works. You didn't get here because you did something incredible. I carried you here on eagle's wings. Even when you were too busy to notice me, I noticed you. When you cried out, I heard your cry and I carried you here. And then comes the shift in conversation. I brought you here, but now I need you to listen. Now, if you obey me fully, fully, important word, and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations, you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Now, these are two very important thoughts here. Kingdom of priests and a holy nation. One of the most important functions of the priest was to pray for atonement. This idea of reconciliation between God and people because of all the wrong things the people had done. Now, it was not a perfect system. That's why eventually God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to be our one true perfect high priest who made this perfect intercession, this perfect reconciliation between God and humanity. But until then, this was the system. But notice the language, a kingdom of priests. Every single Israelite was meant to be a priest. And so every single Israelite had this ministry of reconciliation, not with their fellow Israelites, because they were all priests, but with the nations of the world. In fact, God wanted to bless the nations of the world through the nation of Israel. And it was the nation of Israel's high calling to represent the presence of God before the world. Now, interestingly, during this time, there are... Uh, there were no Bibles. There were no books as we have them today. There were no websites or promotional material. There was no social media platforms. And so to share the presence of God meant that you were sharing of your life. And so you needed to be a holy nation because the people of God, and you need to hear this, the people of God were intended to mediate, to be the vehicle of the presence of God and being a holy people is what made God real to others. So God goes on to say, these are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. So Moses went back and summoned the elders of the people and set before them all the words of the Lord had commanded him to speak. And the people responded together, we will do everything the Lord said. And so Moses brought their answer back to the Lord. But here's the catch. You can't tell people about something you haven't experienced. And so they had to make a choice. Will today be like yesterday or will today be the first day of the rest of your life? And God implored them. God warned them. And, and, and this really is the title of our message today in this series, uh, the first day of the rest of your life. But this is the topic of the theme of today. Don't resist, but commit to the presence of God in your midst. If you want today to be a wonderful day of the rest of your life, don't resist, but commit to the presence of God 
in your midst, even now as you're watching, whether it's your bedroom or your kitchen, God is right there in your midst, but he's there for the same reason he was here in this text. He carried you to this point to help you understand that you have a plan, that he has a plan for your life and a purpose for your life. And he wants to see his powerful presence manifest in your life so that you can experience his blessing, so much blessing that it overflows to the people around you, regardless of what you've done or what's been done to you. Because of God's incredible presence and grace, today can be the first day of the rest of your life. But will you commit? That was the question God had for Israel. Will you commit? <clears throat> and it's it's kind of a tricky question because following isn't always the same as committing. So for example, in church, we use the phrase follower of Jesus Christ. And it really comes from the scriptures because God, Jesus said, follow me. Uh, and before Christians were known as Christians, before Christianity was known as Christianity, we the religion was called the way and we were called followers of the way. And so this phrase, being followers of Christ, is an appropriate phrase that we need to keep using. But I've learned something about following. You can actually follow on autopilot. In fact, I've seen this with our kids that, you know, you'll just kind of get up and you'll kind of go, huh, I wonder what's that? And you'll just walk by and then, and our kids at least will kind of go, huh. And they'll just start following. They don't even know what we're doing. You know, we could be heading towards the laundry and then they realize, oh, laundry, I don't want to be here. You know, I don't want to do that. But they just, they just kind of follow. They follow on autopilot. And, And even you, right? I mean, there are some of you and you don't, you actually, if you want to say this in the chat, you can but there are some of you, you get up in the morning, you get up at, you know, five or six or whatever, and you drive to work, but you've done that morning commute so often that you can just do it on autopilot. In fact, there are some days probably you get in the car and then you just kind of blank and you're in the parking lot at work and you're not entirely sure how you got there. Or perhaps, you know, you you get in the car to go home and and you blink and, and all of a sudden like you're in your driveway. And that's obviously a dangerous place to be and you don't want that to happen. You want to be well rested. But it just underscores a point that you can you can follow on autopilot. In fact, following on autopilot takes very little commitment so long as it's consistent. You can even follow on momentum. Because of you know quarantine, people don't really come to the church door as much. And so when the doorbell rings, ding dong, you know, and I see one of the staff get up and I, you know, walk up the uh, you know, walk past my office to see who's at the door, I always I get excited and I just go too because you know, you know, not many people visit. And so I go. And it's usually a delivery, never for me. It's always for for Miss Vinny. She's, you know, kind of filling up our children's area with children's stuff, which is fantastic. Although I wouldn't mind a delivery every once in a while. But, you but you know, I get up and I go because I can see the excitement and I'm following just the momentum of what's happening. In fact, this is how riots and mobs escalate. People get caught up in the momentum of what's happening. And when you are on autopilot and when you're just going with momentum, there's very little commitment required. Israel had been following God, but were they committed? It says here, now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant. See, they were following God. They followed God out of Egypt, but were they fully committed? They followed God through the parted waters of the Red Sea, but were they fully committed? committed. They followed God to the base of the mountain on the first day of the third month, but were they committed? See, following, of course, is important, but there is a difference between following and committing. And that difference makes me wonder, have some people, maybe you, used following to get out of committing? So for example, you might say, well, you know, I I followed my wife, I followed my husband to church. What more do you want from me? Maybe, you know, you grew up, maybe you're still in the midst of growing up and and you go to church or one day you'll come back to church with your parents and and you follow them there. And and you, you know, you you memorize the, the, the Bible verses you're supposed to memorize. You sing the songs you're supposed to sing and do the things you're supposed to do just like everyone else. And maybe today you're thinking, okay, well, I did it. What more does God want from me? I've been following. But is it at all possible that In our faith, some of us have been following on autopilot and on momentum. 
And, and I think this is what has made COVID-19, at least one of the things that has made COVID-19 such a disruption to Christian faith. I think COVID-19 has disrupted autopilot and momentum-based faith. Like it used to be, you know, you would just show up. And so long as the preacher isn't like boring or too intense, it's a fairly comfortable experience. Like you get coffee out of it and you sit in a nice padded chair. Although I don't know what it was like in Traders, but we've got great chairs in our sanctuary. And and honestly, I can't wait for you to put your derriere in them. They're really comfortable. And honestly, like, you know, it used to be you just show up and, and so long as it's not too boring or intense, it's a comfortable experience. But because of this disruption, I think autopilot and momentum based faith has become exponentially more difficult. Now more than ever, faith actually requires well thought out and intentional commitment beyond the norm. But you have to be careful with that word commitment because while it carries the idea of obedience, you know, being committed, you know, doing the things God told you to do, while it carries the idea of obedience, that's not where it starts. In fact, I would dare say that obedience with or obedience without experience can be disastrous. When I became a follower of Christ, I actually didn't learn about the lifestyle of a committed follower of Christ until much later. And eventually, I understood that a life of faith meant leaving certain things behind. But I didn't start that way. My commitment to Christ started with an experience of Christ through the presence of Christ that gradually changed my identity. And at least for me, I think if if someone had reversed that, instead of starting with an experience of Christ through the presence of Christ, which led to an obedience, I think if someone reversed those and put obedience first, saying, if you really want to experience God, you have to live a certain way and do certain things. I think for me, it would have been disastrous. And I think probably for you too, but at least for me, an experience of the presence of God preceded obedience to the word of God. And, and maybe you read this and, and you think to yourself, I actually experienced the exact opposite. Growing up, I had to believe certain things and behave a certain way and act a certain way or else. And, and maybe today, you know someone, maybe you are someone and you just can't wait to get out of church. In fact, maybe there's a part of you that loves COVID-19 only because it, it became your proverbial get out of church free card. But Would it surprise you to learn that God doesn't want to start with obedience when it comes to faith in your life? And and look, I can understand how people can get the wrong idea, though. Like when you read the Bible, in particular, Exodus chapter 20, the Ten Commandments, ten colossal rules of do's and don'ts. And then in addition to those ten, there are hundreds more in Exodus 21 to 40 laws about social, personal and religious behavior. Now, again, Israel didn't have the kinds of laws that nations typically have. And so God gave them a lot of that. So in a lot of ways, you know, the Old Testament, particularly the first couple of books, particularly Exodus, was more than just a religious book. It it was God giving them an identity as a nation and a people of God. And while all that was important, that's not where God started. In a lot of ways, he started in chapter 19 when he said, You will be for me. Being came before doing. Being was an act of God's grace and doing was a response to that grace. And the law served as a guardrail to keep them on the right track. But the guardrail was never the front door. The front door was God's saving presence, his eagle's wings. But being, you know, wasn't some emotional response being is your identity but had their identity changed if you call yourself a person of faith if you call yourself a committed follower of christ has your identity changed because christianity without a transformed or a changed or a healed or a a restored identity will lead to tragedy in your faith. If your identity hasn't been changed by the presence of God, those guardrails will probably feel more like prison bars. And Israel's identity didn't change for a lot of reasons, but but one of the primary reasons was 
But as they journeyed to the promised land, the land that God had promised them, a land of God's favor, a land of God's blessing, as they journeyed to the promised land, they brought Egypt with them. They brought their past and their shame and their blame and their sins and their um, you know habits that did not honor God. They brought a lot of that with them. And they learned the hard way that the more of Egypt you bring with you, the less of the promised land you will experience in you. And, you know, there are, there are some Christians who I think use partial obedience in some areas to get out of God's presence, bringing light to some dark areas in their lives that they would like to keep dark. And so they use partial obedience they come to church and they sing the songs they're supposed to sing. They pray the prayers they're supposed to pray, but they haven't really fully opened up their hearts. And the tragedy is that the more of Egypt you bring with you, the less of God's promises will others see in you. And if they don't see it in you, then how will they believe it? Now, this is where it gets a little peculiar, if you will, um, how, how are people supposed to see the presence of God at work in the life of a believer or even in the life of a church? And, and again, this is where it gets a little strange. And, uh, you know, I, I am a bit of a nerd when it comes to like Bible stuff. And so this is kind of like my, my nerd moment where I'm going to give you a history lesson. But before I give you that, let me make a, let me make a peculiar statement and then, then I'll, I'll explain it. The presence of God is, and I think should be, more peculiar than popular. After World War I and World War II, the Western church experienced a massive numerical and financial expansion. Christianity seemingly became, you know, solidified as the central, one of the central hallmark parts of our culture. In fact, uh, TV shows and music and all the rest of it, in a lot of ways, reflected or at least respected Christian values. But the problem with the crisis of World War I and World War II is that crisis doesn't last. And so all that growth we experienced in the 40s, 50s, and early 60s started to fade. And by the late 60s, people started leaving church uh, at a macro level. And as they left, the church did many things, but there were two really important things that we did as a, as a Western you know, Christendom movement. One, we, uh, <clears throat> we, we started to find new and creative and extravagant ways to bring people back but, but the thing that we really tried to do with all of our creative ways was that we tried to get back to the center of culture. And we spent a lot of time, have spent, are spending a lot of time, energy, and money, a lot of creative and extravagant and actually expensive ways to, you know, become more a part of the mainstream on YouTube and Instagram and Facebook and just kind of that social sphere. And I'm not saying that's wrong, but that, that's what a lot of, of our energy went toward. And today we have another global crisis, not on the same level as World War One or World, World War Two, but still a crisis. But instead of bringing people back to church, COVID-19 seems to have accelerated What's already been happening since the late 60s? There's been this sudden rush towards the proverbial door, and many are convinced that a larger majority than we want to admit is not going to come back. And not only will they not come back, Christianity will be moved even further to the fringes of culture, to the fringes of what's popular and cool or whatnot, um, to just to the fringes of our society. And so in response, what do we do? We have a pretty good idea of what the church did in response to that decline that started in the 60s. You can take a look at church history in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. We have a pretty good idea of the creativity and the extravagance and the expense and the time and the talent and the treasure that went towards keeping people and getting people back and I do think God did a lot of great genuine work during those decades, but is that the approach that we should adopt today? Is God calling us back to the center of pop culture, if you will, or at least 
near the center? Are we supposed to become popular again? What if, what if COVID-19 was in part God trying to tell the church, I don't want you to be popular. I want you to be peculiar. And I'm not sure the popular approach has really worked out for the church, to be honest. In fact, some of our most popular figures have very publicly fallen. In fact, and I won't use names, but even in the past couple of months, you know, we 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 just had two very prominent, one, probably one of the most prominent figures, uh, or one of them, uh, figures of Christianity fall. Um, and, and, you know, I think it, it probably has created a crisis of faith for a lot of people. I mean, my TV is covering it, but I have some of this one individual's books. And honestly, like, I, I'm wondering, do I even keep, you know, their few books on my shelf because of the way in which they fell? And uh, w- w- when one of these people fell uh, on my YouTube video or stream, whatever it's called, channel suggestions, um, it came up, you know, uh, somebody was commenting on the fall of this one pastor. And I don't know why it came up. Well, I guess I was, you know, researching, you know, this pastor. Just, I just wanted to see what happened. And uh, and so there was a podcast. The individual's name whose podcast it was is Joe Rogan. I don't watch the Joe Rogan podcast. There's a lot of colorful language, as I learned. But I just wanted to get a sense of what someone who's not a Christian thought of all this. And, uh, and, you know, all the things you would think they think, they thought. But as I was watching that little segment of his podcast, I just scrolled down the comments. And there was one comment there. I had a couple of expletives in it. I'll leave those parts out. But the one expletive or the one phrase just basically said, without the expletives, it's time for pastors to stop being cool. And I thought, oh, that's kind of a strange. I don't know who I don't know if that person was a Christian. There was a lot of expletives. But as I thought about it, I thought about this, though. That has God called us to be popular or to be peculiar? Did God call Israel to be popular amongst the nations or did he call them to be a peculiar people? And if he did, what made them peculiar? Well, when you read verse 6, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. God intended for others to experience the presence of God through the people of God, and they're holy, and probably to, to, to people looking in on them, peculiar lifestyles were not only meant to honor God, but their holy and peculiar lifestyles were meant to be a light in a world that relished, and to be honest, still relishes behaviors in the dark. But most significantly, that this lifestyle, being a holy people, this obedience was the overflow of the continual presence of God in their lives. They were meant to be a presence-driven people. And today, you and I are called by God to be a presence-driven people, a presence-driven church. You are a conduit of God's presence. When you walk in the room, in some amazing way, you give people an opportunity to experience a piece of eternity because you are a people on whom God's face shines. You are a people on whom God's favor rests. You are a people that God is behind, that God is around, that God is in, that God goes before you with his presence. And regardless of what you've done, regardless of what's been done to you, if you are committed to Christ and when you move forward in Christ, you walk forward in a victory that our world desperately needs to experience. But if he goes ahead of you with his presence, then on the first day of the rest of your life, leave what's behind you, behind you. Don't resist, but commit to the presence of God in your midst. But how do you do that? How do you commit to God? How do you commit to living a life sensitive to his presence in the 21st century, in 2021, in the year of quarantine, in the year of COVID? How do you do that today, tomorrow, this month, this year? Well, what did Israel do? Well, simple. They set up camp at the base of the mountain where they met God. And, you know, out of all the things that I could tell you today, in closing, I, I, I'd like you to do this. And, and maybe you can't do it today, but, but I think out of all the things that you can do this year, 
I think this would be one of the most significant in closing. Find your mountain and camp. Rest in the presence of God. But as you rest in his presence, I have to warn you, some, some things are going to happen that, that maybe you won't expect. As you rest before his presence, God will address areas in your life where there is only a partial obedience. Because God knows a partial commitment will rob you of a true fulfillment that you can experience in, in him. And as you experience the power of his presence, it will pave the way for others to experience God's abundance. The nation of Israel was called to bless the whole world through the blessings that God blessed them with. And I can't speak for uh, a global impact or a national impact, but I believe that God has put Heartland at 1100 Canadian place to be a blessing to those around us. As you experience a, a move of the presence of God in your life, it won't just bless you, it will bless others around you. But don't confuse the mountain top with base camp. Don't confuse mountaintop moments with base camp moments. The mountaintop moments are when we are excited and we give praise to God for all the things that he's brought us through. But before you get to the mountaintop, you start at base camp. You start at the base of the mountain where you rest in the power of his presence and you allow the goodness of his presence, where you allow his glory to change you from the in side out. And so even as we close in worship, as we close with singing this song, we're not just singing a song. This is an opportunity for you to find a mountain and camp before his presence. Because before you need a home office, before you need more money in the bank, before you need to be set free from whatever, what you and I need more than anything else on this proverbial first day of the rest of our lives, of the rest of 2021, is to have a life-changing encounter with the the presence of God. And so as we sing, we're not just singing, we're inviting God to come into our lives. And we're saying, Lord, we're not at the mountaintop yet, but we've chosen to set up camp at the base of your mountain because we know before we need anything on that mountaintop, we need to experience you here in the valley. And so as we sing, I invite you to open up your heart fully and to experience the power of his presence. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ
dressed in his righteousness alone. A fallen stand before the throne. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the same. Father, thank you for today, and we thank you, God, that despite the things that we've experienced in 2020, we believe with our whole hearts that because your presence goes before us, we have a hope that others cannot even begin to comprehend. That because your presence goes before us, we have access to a power to live the kind of lives that you have called us to live each and every day. And so, Father, I pray at the beginning of this year, I pray a blessing on your people. I pray a blessing on your church. Father, may we experience your incredible presence as we figure church out, as we figure out our lives, as we figure out what to do in 2021. And I pray, oh God, in Jesus' name, that as we rest in your presence, that you would give us incredible hope and incredible purpose for 2021. Lord, we thank you and we love you and we commit, we commit our lives to you. We commit to following you each and every single day. In Jesus' name, amen. Happy New Year again, Heartland, and to all those watching, have a great day and we'll see you next week.